fatal flaw. So you can do all this hard work without any heart. Here's the lesson I want to give you for this morning. It's this, religion is heartless. Religion is heartless. Jesus himself, when he's talking to the people in Ephesus, he says, I know all these great things that you've been doing. I know your hard work, but you have forsaken your first love. They're doing all these things, but they aren't doing them from a place of love. They've lost their love. They've forsaken their love. And, and so the truth is that you can be a very religious person with no heart whatsoever. And I know you know exactly what I'm talking about. You can do rituals. Yeah, not a problem. Okay, so I need to show up the first Sunday of the month. I need to participate in communion. I can do that. Okay, so I need to uh, pray a certain prayer before I go to bed, before I eat my meals. I can do that. Okay, I need to read my Bible at a certain time of the day. Okay, I can do that. These are rituals. I can get them done, check them off my list, move on to the next thing. But you can do all of that without any heart whatsoever. Religion by nature itself, check this, religion is heartless. There is no heart in the religious doctrines, rituals, kinds of duties. And this is the danger. I'm telling you straight out. This is the danger. If you get too close to religion, religion, having no heart, will act like a vacuum and it will suck the heart right out of you. It will suck it clean out. When I was in Chicago, I remember I was in a, a kind of a conflict with one family. I had been the pastor of this church for almost a year. And I remember the first day I had any interviews with the people in this church, I was sitting at a dinner table and we were sharing a meal and there was a guy across the table from me and he looked at me straight in the eye and he said, okay, when you come to town, do you plan to change our church constitution. I was like, what? Okay, no, I'm not planning to change the constitution, but then again, I haven't read it yet. So how about you give me a copy, let me look at it, and then, you know, we'll discuss it after that. But no, it is not my intention to come in here and start working on a document. I'm more interested in trying to help people find Jesus. That's where we're going. And he was like, okay, okay. Well, a little while later, we had just finished almost the first year, and I taught a class that I called Renewal. And we did this whole class where I was trying to get people to reinvigorate their spiritual lives. And the church at the time, when I got there, we had about 40 people, and by the time we made it around one year, we're around 60 or 70 people, and I wanted to reinvigorate people, give them life with their spirituality again, and, and away from some of the religious deadness and nonsense. And in the midst of it, I taught a lesson on the biblical principle of tithing. Uh, tithing is this principle that you take the first 10% of what God has given to you, you give it back to the church, and God blesses you with more. That's kind of the way tithing works. Sometimes he blesses you with more finances. Sometimes he blesses you with more uh, peace <laughs> in your heart. But that's sort of the principle that I taught. Well, this guy stood up in a business meeting. You tracking with me on business meetings? I'm not really a fan. He stood up in a business meeting in front of all the people, this same guy who asked me the Constitution question, and he said, our pastor is teaching things that are out of line with the church Constitution. And I was like, oh. Who cares about the church constitution? It's in the Bible. I'm just teaching the Bible, but I didn't say anything. I talked to him over the next couple of weeks, a couple months, and tried to say, okay, this is where I'm coming from. This is a biblical thing. There's nothing actually in the constitution of this church that prohibits what I just taught. So let's just try to get through this, learn from each other, and come to some type of solid biblical understanding of what Jesus has for us, what he really wants for us. Well, the debate continued. This guy was not going to relent. He was not going to step back. He was very angry at me. And through the whole time, there was another man in the church who was my right-hand man. I mean, he was a solid friend. His name was Gary, and he, I had the sense, just loved me. Every time he saw me, he'd call me chief. I was like, hey, that's kind of fun. You know, I'm the pastor of the church. He's calling me chief. He's like 15 years older than me. It was kind of fun. But so he loved me, though. I knew that. And he walked with me through this process. Eventually, the first family, the family that um, had debated me on the tithing issue, eventually they left the church. Do you know what happened? Not even three months later, 
Gary found an issue where he and I disagreed over something in the Bible. I said, we're going to obey 1 Timothy in this church, and he said, no, we're not. I don't want to go there. And what happened in that moment was he then became an adversary, completely flipped, shifted, and he and his family eventually left that church too. And I was like, come on. What just happened here? Well, you know what happened. Religion sucked the love out of that relationship. I said, we're going to follow what the Bible says. And there was this, this whole attitude where he had invested so much of his heart in standing with me during this religious debate with this other guy that his love got sucked completely out of him. And when we were done with problem A, there was no love left to cover over problem B and to deal with problem B. And so in problem B, it was it. He was done. And that same chain reaction happened over and over in that church about four different times, that same kind of chain reaction, where I saw with my eyes love get sucked out of people's hearts because of some religious kind of mumbo-jumbo nonsense that had gotten people locked in in that church. And that's kind of what is happening here in Ephesus. These people have the religious thing down. They have it straight. They're going really well at it, but somehow the love has gotten sucked out. I want to take you back to the way it started with Ephesus. The, the cool thing about uh, Ephesus is that we've got a lot of other stuff in the New Testament that tells us about Ephesus. We've got a book that Paul wrote to the Ephesian church. We've got stories in Acts that tell us about the people in Ephesus. So flip your note sheet over and we're going to look at Ephesus' first love, how it got started. Ephesians chapter 1 Verses 15 through 16, Paul is writing to the church. He says this, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love, go ahead, underline that word or circle it or something, and your love for all the saints, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. What was their first love? The first thing Paul heard about when he heard about them was their love for all the saints, their love for each other, their love for the body of Christ that was developing in their city. They loved it. They loved being together. They loved relating to each other. They loved experiencing God's power in the midst of what they were doing. In fact, they loved each other and they loved God so much that we can read in the book of Acts chapter 19 an amazing thing that happened. I'll give you a quick backstory. What happened in Acts chapter 19 before the passage we look at is that God did some amazing miracles. Amazing miracles. You're going to have to look up the chapter yourself and find out what those miracles are. But we pick up the story in verse 17. And when they find out about all these miracles, we begin reading. When this became known to the Jews,